John chapter 20, 1 through 18. If you want to turn to that, we'll be looking at a couple of those verses a few times. On the screen there, there's kind of a diagram of the tomb. It talks about in the text how they have to go to the tomb and they have to bend down to to look in. This is just... um, a reconstruction of what it might have looked like. We don't, don't have an exact description here in the Bible itself, but this is, might be what it, what it would look like. You, you can go up to it and you can look into it, but then there's a little room in there that's carved right out of the rock, and then you can go in there and lay down. But apparently you have to bend down in order to look in and to lean over. And so, so the opening is rather small and lower to the ground. This, this is the story that we proclaim. That Jesus didn't just die on the cross. He rose again. You can't have that one without the other. He rose again. Verse 1, it says there, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Verse 1, it says, While it is still dark, while it's still dark. Darkness in the Bible, and throughout the whole Bible actually, kind of represents everything that's wrong with this world. We talked about that a while back in this sermon series, how darkness represents things that are wrong. In the beginning of the Bible, when God created everything, He created the heavens and the earth, but it says there was darkness. And darkness represents chaos, things that, are, things that are wrong. And then later in the Bible, there's a plague in the Egyptians of darkness. It kind of symbolizes a rejection of God. And then when Christ was dying on the cross, it was dark from noon to three. And that just kind of symbolized how Christ was completely rejected by God. And so here, Mary goes to the tomb and it's still dark. It's still dark. It hasn't gotten light yet. John is big into symbolism, and so we know that this is on his mind here. So we, can, we realize here that Jesus was gone already before first light that morning. In other words, when Mary arrived, it was still dark. He was already gone. He had arisen already while it was still dark. And in God's way, the way that he typically does things, God's redemption has a way of starting even when things are still at their worst for us. Even before we realize it, God's redemption is already at work. And that's what's going on here. God's redemption overcame the darkness. The darkness can't hold Jesus in the tomb. It can't keep Jesus dead. God didn't have to wait for the darkness to lift. He broke through the darkness when it was at its peak. He didn't wait for the light. The light triumphs over the darkness, as it says in the beginning of John, but the darkness has not understood it. They didn't understand what was going on. I mean, the disciples heard Jesus say, hey, I'm going to rise again in three days, but it didn't really click with them, apparently. Because... They were here worried about a grave robbery. As Mary said, they've taken my Lord away. I don't know where they put him. So from a human perspective, their, their worries were valid because there were grave robbers. You know, people were buried with sometimes their, the things that they treasured and the spices, the linens that they were wrapped with were kind of expensive. So grave robbery, that was kind of a common thing. So thinking, oh, he's gone, maybe somebody stole the body, that wasn't out of the ordinary. So it was a valid concern, but really they didn't need to be worried about that. If you read with me verses 5 through 7, he bent over and looked, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in, that's uh, the beloved disciple. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb, He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. 
The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. All right. What this is saying, the, the strips of linen and, and this folded cloth here, you know, when the Bible gives us details, always pay attention. Because that, there's, there's always significance in the details. Whether we recognize it or not, there's, there's significance there. And the significance here is that this is not a grave robbery. If somebody had taken Jesus' body, they would not have wasted time taking off all those linen. Especially since they were valuable. Robbers would not have wasted time unwrapping all that cloth and all those spices that were valuable just to take his body away. When Jesus rose, all of that was left behind. All that was left behind. This is not a grave robbery. So when they saw those strips of linen there, this would have just baffled them even more. Like, what happened here? Verse 8. Finally, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and believed. And then 9. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. It's kind of a kind of an awkward double phrase there. It's like he saw and believed, but they didn't get it. Saw and believed, but he, he didn't understand. It's like, okay, something happened here, but I don't get it. So even looking at that empty tomb, they, they still didn't get it. We're we're kind of like that too. We can see God's work around us. It's obvious to us that it's there, but we don't always understand what's going on. We don't put it together the way God is making it happen. We can see what God does around us, like it's a beautiful day this morning. We can see that. It's obvious to us, but it doesn't always register, hey, Look at the beautiful day that God has made for us today. You think, oh, that's just the way it happens. God's at work in each of our lives in different ways. Do we recognize what He's doing? Do we notice what He's doing? If you look here in this text, in verse 13, they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? The two angels that were in the tomb. And then later, in verse 15, woman, Jesus said, why are you crying? Why are you crying? That occurs twice in the text here. That's, that's significant. When the Bible doubles up on something, that's significant. And what's fascinating is that poor Mary here, she thinks that somebody took Jesus away and she has reason to believe that, even though that's not what happened. It's a valid concern that she has. And the question is, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Poor Mary thinks that Jesus is taken away, and she gets asked, why are you crying? From the end of the story, because we know what happens... It's actually a valid question. Why are you crying? We can ask ourselves that too. Why are you crying? Christ rose from the dead. Why do you cry? Now that doesn't mean that we don't have a reason to cry. I mean, Mary had a reason to cry. She had a valid concern there. But... Christ rose from the dead. Why do we cry? It's not that we can't cry, but why do we cry? Just like the resurrection wiped away Mary's tears in Christ, we have our tears wiped away. And not always right when we want them to be wiped away, but this resurrection means a whole lot more than what we think it does. This resurrection wasn't just for Mary. This is for all of us. 
for all of us who trust in Jesus Christ, this resurrection is for all of us. This wipes all of our tears away. Look at the screen here and respond if you would with me. How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection, he has overcome death so that he might make us share in the righteousness he won for us by his death. Second, by his power, we too are already now resurrected to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is a guarantee of our glorious resurrection. So, Jesus rising from the dead, that wasn't just for Mary. That's for all of us. It benefits us in these ways. So, Christ has overcome death and gained for us righteousness. And we are now even already resurrected to a new life as we believe in Him. And finally, that Christ rose from the dead means that we for sure will rise from our graves too. Why do we cry? I don't know if many of you are basketball fans, but it's March Madness season, and uh, maybe some of you have filled out brackets and things like that. I, I know I did. And uh, it's interesting, isn't it, how we cheer for teams that are in, in these seasons, or if you're a football fan or a baseball fan, we, we cheer for teams, don't we? We, we somehow identify with, with these teams, and, and their victories are our victories, and we, we celebrate when they win, and we get all disappointed when they lose. And it's, what's fascinating is how, how well we identify with these teams. We buy their jerseys, we, we, have, their, we have collections, we have keychains, and all of these things that make us identify with, with these teams that we follow. And I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm just, isn't that interesting that we identify with teams that we've never been on? None of us have actually played for these teams. Or maybe we don't even play the sport. But we connect with these teams. And when they win, it's really exciting. We jump up and down and we shout. And when they lose, it's really devastating. When Michigan State lost this year in the first round. My dad who, and mom, who both of them went to Michigan State, they were like, huh, I'm not even going to watch the tournament anymore. It was really discouraging. They never played for the team. They went to the school. And I was rooting for them. I never went to the school, but it was kind of discouraging. We, we connect with those teams. When they win, we say, we won. We won. That's just fascinating to me. We're not on the team, but we won. Well, Jesus rose from the dead. We won. If you belong to Jesus Christ, then this victory over death is our victory. We can celebrate. We can be happy. This victory is our victory. And we don't need to wear a Jesus jersey to have that victory. His victory is ours. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll read that this week in the Bible reading tracks. We have victory in Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have any problems or that nothing bad ever happens to us. I know, as I look out at you, I, I know a number of your stories and, and I know there's a lot of difficult things that many of you have dealt with and are dealing with. Sin and suffering and death can win exhibition games in our lives, but they lost the Super Bowl when Jesus arose. The game of all games, they lost. And so, they have some small victories in our lives. And it hurts when we lose those. It doesn't feel good at all. But because Jesus won the game of all games, we can celebrate. We can lose these smaller games. And that, they hurt, and that's, that's understandable. But Jesus won the big game. 
the game. If you have your bulletins, you notice that there's this piece of paper in here. Flowers placed in front of church are there in loving memory of. And then there's two sides of it. And you can see all these flowers up here. And this is not, this is not an every Sunday sort of a thing. This is not an every Sunday sort of a thing. We celebrate something. Even though Jesus rose from the dead, and that was a long time ago on the other side of the world, this is our victory too. It's not just Jesus that overcame death. It's we did and all of these people that are on this, this, this list here, people who have gone before us, this is their victory too. We win. We won. That's this victory that we celebrate today. The way we've been talking in this sermon series about how the way of Christ means suffering, and it does. When you follow Jesus Christ, you have to make sacrifices. You're going to have to count the cost. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. And there's going to be some really difficult things that are going to go along with that. But the way of Christ just isn't just suffering. It's also victory. The way of Christ is the way of victory. If you want to win, then walk in the way of Christ. It is a way of suffering. There's a cross, but there's an empty tomb. And if we belong to Jesus Christ, in belonging to Him, His victory is our victory. It wasn't just He who overcame death, it's we who overcome death too. Romans 6, 4 through 5, We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with Him like this in His death, we will certainly also be united with Him in His resurrection. This is our victory too. We can celebrate. And so, it is true. If you follow Jesus, if you call Him your Lord and Savior, you will have to carry crosses. Get ready for that. Get ready for those crosses. It takes sacrifice to follow Jesus. There's going to be a lot of times when you're going to have to experience rejection and laughter by other people who aren't following that way. And there's going to be commands that he gives you that are going to sound ridiculous, unreasonable even. Why do I have to follow that? There's commands that he gives that we're not going to like all the time. And when people are laughing in our face about following Jesus or even believing something like somebody rose from the dead, get ready to deal with that graciously like Jesus did when he was mocked and rejected. Mary was here at that tomb that first morning and she was crying. As, as with Mary, when you follow Jesus, there will be times of crying. Jesus wipes all our tears away, but that doesn't mean that we won't have tears. We will. Sometimes those tears come from regular things that happen in life. Sometimes it comes from just following Jesus and those sacrifices that we have to make for Him. And just like the disciples were, were there and, and they were confused and they didn't understand, even though know, it says that the beloved disciple that He believed, He, he still didn't get it. As with the disciples, when you follow Jesus, there will be times of of loss and confusion. God doesn't operate always in the ways we expect. He doesn't always come through in the ways that we want Him to. And His promises sometimes don't make sense. Even when we're staring at the fulfillment right there, it's like, okay, um, did did Jesus really say He was going to rise in three days? I mean... I don't get it. There's, there's going to be those times. But when you follow Christ, the victories smash all tears and worries. We can say, we won. No matter what 
we face, no matter how difficult it can be, we won. We won. We can hold up this victory no matter what other losses we experience because this one was the one that counted. So I'll end this Easter today. If you experience losses in your life from now or, or in the future, I want you to think to yourself, we won because Jesus won. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so glad, Lord, that you give us the victory through Jesus Christ and the victory that he has won for us. Thank you, Lord, that we can share in that victory. And we pray, Lord, that that victory would be real for us. That, Lord, as we experience difficulties and losses in life, that we would hold on to this victory and that it would keep us going through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.